to live as Christ. Uh, the text this morning is from Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. You don't have to turn there. It's a very short text. Paul says to live as Christ. Two of the biggest questions probably that have ever been asked on the earth are what does, the, does it mean to live and who is Christ? A person can spend a, a lifetime exploring the purpose of life and finish their lives still searching. And academics more genius than us have spent a lifetime researching who is Christ and die with as many questions as when they began. And we have 30 minutes, maybe a few minutes more. So I've got no choice but to generalise on the question of the meaning of life. And I make no apologies for that. But I will specialise on who is Christ. And we will zoom in close and get personal with Jesus this morning. Firstly, some presuppositions. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable. It is our authority on these matters. Presupposition, Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And in saying thy word of truth, Christ affirmed the inspiration, veracity and authority and sufficiency of scripture. Genesis 1.1, presupposition 3, in the beginning God, the eternal existence of God our creator. And John 1, 1 to 5 affirms the pre-existence as create, of Christ as creator and saviour, as the second person of the Trinity, God and three pe people, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in verse 14, the second person became flesh, Jesus Christ, fully God, yet fully man. These presuppositions shouldn't surprise you. This is a church, and I'm preaching. A broad brush approach to the question of what does it mean to live? Different strokes for different folks. I'm going to begin with some, some quotes and they reflect different philosophies on a successful life. Jimmy Durant says it's sensibly, be nice to people on the way up because you do not know who you'll meet on the way down. John Wayne says it practical, life is tough but it's tougher when you're stupid. <laughs> Tom Landy calls it logically. Today you have 100% of your life left. Jennifer Aniston calls it selfishly. Once you figure out who you are and what you love about yourself, I think it all just falls into place. Stephen King calls it pessimistically. Get busy living or get busy dying. And Kevin Hart calls it persistently. Everybody wants to be famous, but nobody wants to do the work. I live by that. You grind hard so that you can play hard. At the end of the day, you put all the work in and eventually it'll pay off. Could be a year, could be 30 years, eventually your hard work will pay off. And Anonymous calls it competitively. Get what you can, can what you get, and poison the rest. <laughs> Forrest Gump calls it the luck of the draw. My mama said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. What does it mean to live a successful or purposeful life? And I make no apologies for generalizing. Here is a sample of quotes that represent 
a few phys- philosophical views on life. The humanist says the true measure of success is how many times you bounce back from failure. Or when you connect to the silence within you, that is when you make sense of the disturbance going on around you. The pagan might say, I am dedicated to the belief that it is God's will that all men should strive for wisdom in themselves, not look for it from others. The hedonist May Brown says, I finally figured out the only reason to be alive is to enjoy it. And similarly, Oscar Wilde said, the only way to get rid of temptation is to yield. Resist it and your soul grows sick with longing for the things it has forbidden to itself. A humanist says, if we live together and not die together, we must learn a kind of charity, a kind of tolerance, which is absolutely vital to the continuation of human life on this planet. It's Russell Bertrand. And Kurt Vonnegut says, I am a humanist, which means that in part I have tried to behave decently without any expectation of rewards or punishments after I'm dead. To embrace humanism is to embrace the concept that caring for others is our highest calling. The atheist Friedrich Nietzsche says, is man merely a mistake of God's or God merely a mistake of man? Mikhail Buckerman, the atheist, said, if God really existed, it would be necessary to abolish him. Bertrand, also an atheist, said, science can teach us and I think our hearts can teach us no longer to look around for imaginary supports, no longer to invent allies in the sky, but rather to look to our own efforts here below to make this world a fit place to live in. The Dalai Lama says it the simplest, the purpose of our lives is to be happy. This is a sampling, a sprinkling of human wisdom and thought. And there are hundreds of philosophies, perhaps even thousands. There are as many opinions on what life means as there are people. Some of you found these quotes humorous, others confronting. Some were offensive, but nothing should surprise you. You all think that what you believe is right. Otherwise, you wouldn't think it. You wouldn't believe it. But it's also fair that some of you do acknowledge that you don't know what you believe or what to believe. But all the philosophies and religions that ever existed and all of time and history fall into only one of two camps, for or against. A kingdom divided against itself will fail. He who is not with me opposes me, and he who is not working with me is working against me. If you dig to the bottom of every philosophy of human wisdom or other religion, there is a hatred of the God of Israel and or a hatred of Christ. Atheists hate the God they say doesn't exist, whatever that means. According to Romans 1, 19 to 20, there there is no such thing as an atheist. Everyone exists with sufficient knowledge of God through conscience and creation to either acknowledge or deny so that they are without excuse. This morning is about just two people. You and God. 
you and Christ. You and your view of what it means to live. Christ and his example of how to live. So we need to get up close and personal. I want you to see Jesus. I want you to feel him. I want you to hear him this morning. So how are we going to do that? Well, I've already primed you. We're going to zoom right in to a few moments of Christ's earthly life. And we will see in those few moments all of him. And in sharing those moments with Jesus this morning, you can decide, are you for him or against him? You can decide whether to live as Christ or whether to live as you or to live as something other than Christ. Now to step into those moments. If I take this sheet of paper, um, the space, the space around me, the space here, let's, let's say that is the fourth dimension. That is where God exists. That is outside of what is created. And let's, let's say that this piece of paper is all of creation. This is the universe created and compressed into this dimension. And Christ enters the world. And the pen dot, the tip of this pen on, on this page is Christ entering this universe as a person. And we're going to join Jesus on the last day of his earthly life. In fact, the last few hours before his death. And we'll hear some of his last words. And he is economical to say the least. And shortly after Jesus ascends back. Okay. Usually the last few words of a person's life are worth listening to. And we join him in a room only 600 metres from where he will be crucified. I'm taking you into the Roman Praetorium. It's a hall. This morning you're in a court. Jesus has been tried and condemned to die by crucifixion. I'm Pontius Pilate. The elders here are the disciples. The elders' wives are the woman who loved Jesus, who followed him. And there's a few Marys in that mix, and a Martha. And you're the crowd, including Pharisees and, and, and Sanhedrin and common people and some Romans. And here is Jesus standing dressed in a purple robe. There's a crown of thorns on his head. Blood flows from his face and freely from his back. By this moment, Jesus has already been physically assaulted, spat on, blindfolded, beaten, mocked, ridiculed. He's come through the Sanhedrin court, which was a sham, with false witnesses. He's come, he's faced off with a kangaroo court. He's been falsely accused of blasphemy for claiming to be the son of God. Hmm. That's pretty much what he's been saying for the last three years. Son of God was exactly who he is. He's been bound with ropes, led around like a convict, taunted, mocked, dressed in silly costumes, and ridiculed some more. Peter, son, would you walk over broken glass for Jesus? Sure, for broken glass, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cock a doodle doo. Peter, son's under the tree in the park weeping. Andrew's running down the road. Hey, you left some clothes behind. The sheep scattered. The disciples fled. Jesus stands here alone. 
the woman who Jesus loves are watching their dreams shatter and their hopes fade and their confidence wane. Cleone, Jesus' mother, remembers when Jesus turned water into wine. She's seen him raise the dead and heal the sick. Haven't you just got one more miracle, Jesus? One more trick up your sleeve? Linda Magdalene remembers the time she was surrounded by accusers. Just say something, Jesus, like you did when I was surrounded by an angry mob and you said, let him who has no sin cast the first stone and one by one all my accusers walked away. Just say something, Jesus. But as the ladies looked on, their hope fading, their confidence waiting, their dream shattering. Jesus can't come back from here, can he? This would be a bigger comeback than Lazarus. And I'm standing here as Pilate. I've been listening to the chief priests and the elders accusing Jesus. And he answers nothing. And I say, Jesus, say something. Exonerate yourself or condemn yourself. Just say something. But like a sheep before its shearers is dumb, Jesus opened not his mouth. You want to know what would happen if Jesus opened his mouth at that moment? I'll tell you what happens when Jesus opens his mouth. Take a look at Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by his breath, all their lights and he spoke and it was done. Jesus could have spoken his accusers out of existence at that moment. Uncreated them. John saw a vision of Christ on a white horse and out of his mouth came a two-edged sword. When Jesus slays the armies of the Antichrist, he's not using his mouth as a sheath to slay those armies. He speaks and those armies are slaughtered. He opened not his mouth. Are you not speaking to me, Jesus? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And then Jesus speaks, not in his defence, but more like a technicality, a point of order. He turns to me, to Pilate, and says, you could have no power at all against me unless it was given to you from above. There are only two people in this room who really know what's going on. God the Father and God the Son. First two persons of the Trinity. Luke 9.22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and must be killed and raised again to life on the third day. Nothing is happening that Christ didn't allow in perfect obedience to the will of his Father. Here Christ demonstrates perfection in his suffering. He doesn't hang his head in shame. He knows no shame. He hasn't done anything wrong. He stands before his accusers and looks them in the eyes. And his eyes are filled with love. He doesn't raise a hand or plead for mercy or ask them to stop. He is fully handed over to be done to as they wish to manifest the full desire and intent of the human heart against the one who claims to be God. And one word sums up the mood in this room. Feral. Don't think for a moment that there is order in this court. 
These are chaotic scenes evolving by the moment. People can smell blood. It's red hot in here, and there's only going to be one outcome, one climax. You see, the death scene has already begun. What's happening here is the unifying power of the human spirit united against God. Only days earlier, you, you had laid palm branches on the, the ground as Jesus rode into Jerusalem and you were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. You saw Christ as your Messiah to rescue you from Roman rule. How quickly things can turn. We are seeing the depth of depravity of the human heart. This is Christ, the miracle worker, the one who claimed to be Messiah, who did what only God could do, who spoke the wisdom and knowledge that only God could speak. And he stands before you unprotected, vulnerable, beaten. So who's on trial? Who's on trial here this morning? Jesus is not on trial, never was, never has been, never will be. You're on trial. You're on trial this morning. The disciples, for their lack, for their fear, the, the, the woman for their lack of faith, the religious leaders for their rejection of the Messiah, Pilate for for a self-preservation, you for your populism. A Messiah at the mercy of men. This is no future king, you say. Your desperate religious leaders are spreading their propaganda. He's fake news, an imposter, a fraud, a blasphemer. You can't believe Jesus. You want to but he just looks too far gone. In a torrent, you join the group thinking, the group think your confidence has waned and you follow the crowd. And don't underestimate the dynamic of lust in this room. Jesus is God's man in every way, spoke as God, worked God's power, displayed God's wisdom, demonstrated God's character. And what happens in the human psyche when you can hit God and nothing happens? When you can pluck his beard and nothing happens? When you can spit on God's man and there's no reaction, you can mock and ridicule God's man and he does not speak, you can beat God's man and he does not raise one arm. And instead of mercy, your unbridled lust is kindled. There is a sense of safety in numbers and hatred grows with the unbridled sense of power over the divine. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes and the people cried out in one voice, Crucify him. All power to the people. Some of you have seen the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ. I have once. That was enough very violent, very graphic, grimacing, brutal, merciless, unrelenting, violence towards Christ. It's like death from a thousand blows. But the physical suffering of Christ is not the real story. Remember Christ's encounter with his father in the Garden of Gethsemane, he became sorrowful and deeply distressed. Jesus said to his disciples, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, such that he felt that he could die at that moment. He cried out to his father, if it is possible, if there be any other way, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours. Was Christ distressed over the physical abuse that lay ahead or death by crucifixion. It's written of Socrates, the philosopher, who was sentenced to death in an Athens prison cell. 
Socrates took the cup of poison hemlock and without hesitation or flinching, quietly drained it. Was Socrates braver than Jesus? You see, they were both cups, but that's not the same. Christ's cup was a symbol of divine wrath. In his death, Christ would bear the sins of many. The fullness of divine wrath would fall on him. Christ was to endure the fury of God over sin. If the anticipation caused Christ to sweat blood such that his capillaries burst and and, and blood literally mingled with profuse sweating, what must have the reality been like? The purple robe is removed and Christ is dressed in his own clothes. And bearing his cross went out. By calculation of cross size and using a, a sleeper dimension of timber, 8 by 4 and assuming a Lebanese hardwood, I estimate the weight of that cross to be 105 to 120 kilograms. So Christ would have to get down to less than 1.2 metres and take the weight of that cross and then stand up. And to move, he would have leant forward and the stipes or the vertical member of the cross would trail behind him as he walked. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. I don't see a government upon his shoulders. I see a cross. I don't see a wonderful counsellor. He says nothing. I don't see a mighty God. I see a man submitting to his accusers. I don't see an eternal father. I see someone who is about to die. And I don't see a prince of peace. I see the son of God about to wear the full fury of God's judgment. You see, folks, First, Christ must redeem, and when he returns, he will rule and reign with his redeemed. Christ doesn't need your sympathy. He wants your confidence. Christ is here willingly, and he wants you to willingly trust him. He could have called 12 legions of angels, one angel wrought destruction on Egypt. So what is he doing in his final steps, those 600 metres? His final words, his dying breath, he's doing what he came for. He's doing what he always does. He's building his church. He's warning of a coming judgment. He's forgiving his accusers and he's saving souls. Christ was building his church. Simon Serene was no random, drawn out of the crowd to take the cross from from Jesus as Christ fatigued. His good evidence that Simon was later converted and his children, Alexander and Rufus, and a church was established in Cyrene. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Christ was warning of coming judgment. And following him were a great crowd of people and women who were mourning and lamenting him, singing the dirge and wailing. But Jesus, freed up from carrying the cross, was able to turn and address them. And Jesus, in that moment, gives them a chilling warning. Daughters of Jerusalem... Do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Don't pity me, pity you. For the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And you will say to the mountains, Fall on us 
and to the hills cover us. And Christ was praying for those who persecuted him as he was lifted up, nailed hands and feet. He looked over the crowds, jeering, insulting still, abusing, taunting. And his prayer was this, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here is Christ fully exercising his character perfectly, praying for those who persecute him, loving his enemies. Forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. And at his feet they divided his garments and cast lots. Why is this mentioned? Psalm 22, 18, they got, divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. Over 50 prophecies fulfilled today. In Christ's death. It also reminds us that Christ died with no earthly possessions. No houses, no cars, no trinkets, no designer labels, no shares, no bank account. All that, those earthly possessions mean nothing in God's economy. Is it all unravelling for Jesus? The God-man? Has God been blindsided by these turn of events? Not for one moment. The perfect fulfilment of a perfect plan purposed before creation itself. God knew before creating a the Redeemer would one day be required. Hebrews 10, 4 to 7, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O Lord. For thousands of years, folks, ever since the fall, the Son's been saying to the Father, Prepare me that body, prepare me that body, that I might go to Calvary and be that perfect sacrifice for sin. And the worst is yet to come for Christ. His accusers continuing their unrelenting mirth, Jesus struggling even to, to, to breathe, is still composed. Aware, interested, mindful even of the thieves dying beside him. Christ is saving souls. <laughs> In his death. One thief epitomizes the human philosophy of self interest and self preservation. And when this life is the only life you've got, you'll try to hold on to it with everything. First thief cries out to Christ, Save yourself and save me if you're the Christ. I'll do anything for another five years in this dirty old town. And the second dying thief rebukes him, demonstrating the heart of a repentant sinner. I'm guilty. Jesus, you're not. I deserve to die. Jesus, you don't. And the sufficiency of a childlike faith, when that faith is on the right person, Christ. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom, to which Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Which also puts to bed the idea that Jesus went to hell for three days. What Jesus, what's Jesus doing in his final hours with his final words and his final breath? Building his church, warning of coming judgment, forgiving his accusers and saving another sinner. So what did God's wrath poured out on Christ look like? I don't know. And I'll never know. Christ bore the penalty of my sin that day. Did he bear the penalty of yours? In the ninth hour, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, My God, 
my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus proclaims, it is finished. Tetelestai is the Greek word, paid in full. And he commits his spirit to his father. And bowing his breath, he breathes his last and yielded up his spirit. Christ's life was never taken. He gave it up. What was happening around him in those last three hours? A dark, heavy pall of blackness descended. The sun was darkened and there was darkness over the land, perhaps even the whole world, for three hours. And this is not just a shadow. If you've been underground like I have in Bendigo, Australia, down into a mine over 100 metres underground, and it's black. You can't see the, can't see your hand in front of your face. You can't see the ground. This blackness, this heavy pour was the, was, was God coming down in a, in, in a blackness of judgment on his son. Did his accusers celebrate Christ's death? No. They may have intended to, but God spoiled that party. A heavy black pall, the presence of God, followed by earthquakes, miracles, graves opening, resurrected bodies coming up. There was the presence of God and judgment on his son, and the people had just killed their only saviour. They weren't going anywhere. They couldn't see. So the whole crowd came together in that frightful experience. They moved to where noise was. They, they couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't see. It's pitch black. And when the darkness lifted, the whole crowd came together and returned home celebrating, beating their breasts, beating their breasts. What have I done? I've made a terrible mistake. But death could not hold Christ. And the angel said to the woman, when they discovered the empty tomb, why do you look for the living among the dead? That's why Paul can say to live as Christ. He's alive. He's alive. The atheist Gene Roddenberry says, we must question the story logic of having an all-knowing and all-powerful God who creates faulty humans and blames them for their own mistakes. I say, we must wonder the story logic of having an all-knowing and all-powerful God who creates humans with the potential to fail and then punishes himself for their mistakes. You have met with Jesus this morning. You have shared the praetorium and accompanied him in his crucifixion. What have you decided? Are you for him or against him? Is to live you and your, your preferred philosophy on life or is, or is to live Christ in the reality Christ offers? And there must be room for faith. You seek compelling, unchallengeable facts and you want to only believe what you can see and touch. But I leave you with this final illustration. The disciple Thomas was not with Jesus when he first appeared in the upper room. And when Jesus heard that they had seen the Lord, he proclaimed, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my hand into the print of his side, I will not believe. And eight days later, Jesus appeared to them again. And he said to Thomas, reach your fingers here into my hands and reach your hand here into my side 
Do not be unbelieving, but believe. To which Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. And Jesus t- said to Thomas, You believe because you have seen. More blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. You can ask the hard questions, but unless you come to Christ by faith, you won't come at all. One of the most frightening and sad statements Christ ever made is in Luke 18, 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Thank you.